Hello and welcome to CX Today. My name is Charlie and today I'm delighted to be joined by two very special guests to talk through five contact center AI challenges and how to overcome them. Yes, today my guests are Niraj Verma, Head of Generative AI Strategy at NICE and Derek Top, Senior Analyst at Opus Research. Thanks, thank you to both of you for joining me. And now let's get straight into those five challenges. Uh, so the first one I have on my list is limited accessibility. Derek, I don't know if you can kind of tell, tell me a little bit about this challenge. Yeah, well, I mean, limited accessibility is, uh, it's a broad term. And when we're talking about AI in the contact center, there is um, a, a number of specific challenges and a number of specific opportunities that we're just getting into. When, when we, you know, there, there's certain things we talk about in accessibility. Mostly this comes around that there is an interest in AI technologies, but there have, hasn't been quite utilized just yet. So um, when, when we talk about uh, having uh, access to conversational AI, which is, you know, including transcripts and recordings and, and all of the different kinds of um, uh, data that contact centers have been gathering over the years um, for, for both, you know, obviously for, 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 for operations improvement, for agent performance, for self-service, all of these are being underutilized or had been previously underutilized in terms of the, the amount of data that's coming into organizations. Um, that, that, that I think is something we can really talk to uh, with when it comes to AI, that, that there, there is, like I said, a lot of awareness, a high, high flexibility around or a, a high interest in using generative AI and, and, and using large language models. But they're still trying to figure out the right use cases, the right time uh, to take advantage of some of the, the, the data that's there and some of the opportunities that AI can provide. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's some really great insight there. And I don't know, Naraj, if you can maybe uh, talk a little bit about how NICE is helping to overcome uh, the challenge that Derek's just uh, pointed out. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll kind of expand upon <clears throat> when you think about the AI landscape in the world today, right? Accessibility is a really important factor. And you, it's not just accessibility. It's almost, it's almost the massive landscape of AI out there in this world, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about generative AI, you've got 500 plus foundation models. How do contact centers not only get access to some of those models, but figure out what's important, right? I mean, it's a, it's a tough problem. And most organizations out there don't have entire teams of research scientists and having billions and billions of conversations to train their own foundation models or fine tune their foundation models. It's a, it's a very tough problem. When I mean, we talk to contact centers, it's essentially impossible, right? They're mm. thinking about, well, should I just use ChatGPT? Should I just use um, Claude? Well, that's not really the right option, right? What NICE has done is that we've taken all these We've taken some of these foundation models, right, from Mistral, from um, Anthropic, from others, and we've created our own fine-tuned models that are very specific and trained on the largest contact center data set in the world, right? We've taken those models and we've made them fully accessible through NICE that are scalable, reliable. The companies, once again, aren't really inundated by what's going to work for them we figure that out we've got the large team of research scientists to help figure that out yeah absolutely i think that's uh, that's an important point actually uh you know a lot of people do see the kind of open ai chat gpt models and just kind of run to that as that's the one that they kind of see in their consumer lives um but yeah lots of lots of good stuff um that start with and i think maybe now let's move on uh, to our second uh challenge and that is achieving cost efficiency. Um, Derek, I don't know if you can start by explaining uh, this one for us too. Yeah, well, and this this gets to the the uncertain nature of all of these new models right now is that um, there is an, uh, an un, well, there's a lot of different pricing variables. And so when we talk about cost efficiency, we're really talking about price. We're, we're talking about the ability to kind of scale up to utilize these, these models in a way that is cost effective to your organization, um, be it through the number of different use cases, which may, may be around call summarization or uh, even like self-service and dialogue. Um, so how do you scale leveraging these new models in a way that does make it uh, uh, cost effective? The pricing of this is, is changing all the time, which makes it even more challenging. But, um, and that, you know, in, in the last, you know, the, the last year, you know, since, well, about a year and a half or so since you know, ChatGPT GPT's come out, there has been some, some different uh, pricing models for each of those. And, and as, as each of the models improve, you know, for GPT, for, for all the ones that Naraj just talked about in terms of Claude and, and Mistral and everything, um, all of those are, are becoming um, kind of a, a new level of standards. You know, talk about like kind of changing, changing that particular fundamental pricing model each 
every three months, six months, um, a year out. It's really it's really a tough moving target, um, not to mention the staffing uh, in terms of leveraging your own internal IT staff or, or agent staff, or whoever, to take advantage of these things. Um, and and, it, and that is, as well as like there's, there's a, a ramping up and onboarding, a, a getting to know the stuff and then let alone um, operationalizing all of these AIs uh, for your organization. That's where it is actually kind of important to really lean on some of your solution providers, some of your, 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 your particular um, partners in, in this. And that could help you kind of understand the pricing and really kind of make sure that your, your balanced approach to AI is, is, is achieved. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's very relevant. You hear stories about kind of businesses just layering on a bit of AI and adding a bit of resource cost, and all of a sudden the costs just escalate. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, Niraj, how is Nice helping to kind of its clients uh, overcome this issue? Yeah, you know, let me kind of frame the problem. I think a little bit more. Generative AI is, <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't say it's new, but it's the usage of it from a wide scale perspective is very new. Mm -hmm. People aren't used to measuring things in the context of how many tokens am I using? How often am I gonna be using this models? And you see all these companies out there, you see all these startups saying, oh look, we've got generative AI, and then they figure out, wow, it costs me more to run it than I could charge my customers. And you've seen this over and over yeah. again. You've seen several companies stop offering AI, you've seen several companies actually go out of business because of how much things like ChatGPT and Claude and other models cost, right? And that's why it's really important when you think about a contact center, right? Contact centers don't take one call a day, mm -hmm. right? They take tens of thousands, if not millions of conversations a day. And you can't just go to an open, you know, you just can't go to a commercial model and just say, hey, look, you know, just let, let me run everything through ChatGPT. You're going to bankrupt yourself. So what NICE and other <laughs> vendors, you know, what NICE specifically has done, once again, is we are using foundation models that are trained on CX data that are very specific to the CX data. And you hear this around the market all, all the time. We're using large language models, but small large language models that are fit mm -hmm. to a purpose and task. And that's what allows us to actually scale to the level of a contact center and to deliver generative AI. That is what I would consider to be truly valuable without costing an arm and leg. Hmm. Yeah, it's the, I guess it's those smaller uh, LLMs that you can host maybe in your own data centers that are potentially the f is potentially the future of this technology. I think that's a fascinating uh, topic and one we could definitely explore much more. But let's move on for the sake of this video uh, to the next challenge, and that is uh, comparing different types of AI models. Obviously, we've already kind of discussed a couple of those models um, already, but how do we know which one's best? I don't know, Derek, if you have any kind of thoughts to start with on this one. Yeah, well, I, I think this just this builds on the points that Naraj just brought up, and in terms of the yeah understanding what the models are appropriate to enterprises and to contact centers is part of the challenge right now. Um, and yeah, like a, just a you know you don't need to understand the the whole of the internet to truly understand what how a contact center can utilize <laughs> some AI models. So um, rather than depending on some of the large foundational consumer models and and that are continually changing, continually evolving. Um, there, there is a need uh, to get CX specific, to get domain specific, to really understand what um, what is uh, the problems you're solving in your organization. The, the good news is this stuff is has been around for a while. As I'm just saying, like there, there, there is a way for this to work now, um, and, and it is a matter of, of, of identifying what those use cases are. Um, again, le leveraging your own data in a way that makes sense to your co consumers and to your customers' problems, and then finding the right model for that. Um, I, I, and granted, it, it is a challenge. I mean, don't get me wrong. There, there is a, a, a kind of a constant, you know, churn of new models being also being renamed, and so it's it is a confusion. There's confusion out there. Um, again, like kind of leveraging what you what you can do with your with your partners to, to understand what what models are appropriate for you that are domain specific that are big enough. That's that's the the models that you use in your you should use in your organization. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to mention Google changing the name of its products. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you really, you know, if you kind of go back to it and think about it one more time, all of these, all these language models out there, it's just like you mentioned, right? They solve generalized use cases and even mm. figuring out what the use cases need to be is very difficult, right? You need a large team of researchers to know that, um, Mistral 7B instruct V1 is really good at this. <laughs> Right. Yeah. If I fine tune it, then it can be really good at this particular thing. And you know, that's exactly what Nice has done, right? We've taken all these foundation models, and once again, we've got 
when I say billions of interactions, that's not a that's not a joke, right? Nice on average has you know well over one million agents on our platform, and a lot of those guys are partners with us that allow us to use some of their data for testing, right? Mm. Which is great, um, and we can test all of those models across tons of data securely, reliably, and figure out what use cases they're good at. And and the the important thing here is that Nice has actually solved the use case. Right? So it doesn't matter what model ends up being used. It's that the use cases are solved for you by NICE. That's the big thing. Right? Solve the use case. Don't pick a model. Pick a use case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and how those work across Agreed. different verticals, actually, is going to be an interesting mm -hmm. conversation um, as well in the near future. Uh, just for time's sake as well, I wish we could spend more time on some of these challenges, mm -hmm. but I will, I will skip ahead to the next one, and that mm -hmm. is uh, ensuring security. I think especially as if we talk about generative AI, this is an issue that comes up a lot. It's almost the elephant yeah. in the room of a lot of these conversations. Um, yeah, Derek, could, again, could you maybe start by sharing your thoughts on this one? Yeah, and, and you're right. This, this is brought up a lot. This has been, you know, kind of um, being the, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the elephant is definitely there and, and people, you know, are talking about it all the time. It's like it, it's something that's all they talk about in terms of hallucinations, the ability to kind of uh, talk about the risks involved. Uh, with 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 you know some of these these uh, these uh, you know AI going off the rails kind of thing, uh, and there's you know and, and that gets a lot of hype in the media around either some potential you know wrong answers that are given from a bot perspective or potentially any kind of you know uh, uh, data that that might be uh, somehow compromised. But 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 yeah, that, that, and it is important. Clearly, I mean, it is. It's it's important to have guardrails. It's important to ensure your your privacy, your data protection, things you've probably already been doing anyway. But I mean, but it really is important to kind of make sure that that is supported within your organization, how you're thinking about it from from a from a use case perspective, from a customer perspective, um, and then make, making sure that you're, you know, um, well, actually, I, I, on, on the point that you brought up just, Charlie, around like verticals, yes, there are even specific elements around FedRAMP or HIPAA or, or whatever your particular vertical might be. Those same type of processes that are in, for, for, are there for, to ensure data protection should also be applied to whatever AI project you're, you're um, continue to go into now. So it, I, I definitely think it as, I think it, it's an element that is important. It's also why a lot of organizations have steering committees. Uh, when, the, when they do talk about AI projects, either for contact center, they bring in compliance, they bring in legal, um, mm -hmm. all, of the other, all of the other kind of necessary, um, you know, uh, executives in your organization that, that need to know what you're doing with the data and how you're using that data is, is important. So, um, yeah, it, it, it can't be under under undervalued, but it still is something that, that people do need to pay attention to. Yeah, and you know, you think about, once again, the security aspect of it, just like you mentioned, right? There's not just one security aspect using an LLM or any kind of model out there. There's several, right? It's, yeah. It's come up over and over again. You know, there was guys at Samsung that accidentally sent out their code into, into a public chat GPT, right? Yeah. And maybe that chat GPT instance is using your data to train with, right? <laughs> you got to be really careful on how you're using LLMs and where you're using LLMs, especially in a really heavily regulated PCI sort of environment of a contact center, right? Yep. And NICE has really solved that problem by hosting our own LLMs within our own sort of four walls, right? That's one of the big realities of the system is that <clears throat> you have to kind of <clears throat> take whatever you're going to use, right? Solving use cases, LLMs and put them in a place where they're going to be secure, right? You don't have to worry about leakage. You don't have to worry about PII. And the other big aspect is that most of our LLMs are very, very, very heavily guardrailed and secured using NICE's own platform called CX Expert, right? That allows what we consider to be the best in the industry guardrails. It's a, it's a really, really important point. And I've seen companies fail over and over again to kind of consider the data privacy implications and the guardrail implications before using LLMs. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's a great topic. And uh, one, I'm sure, as I, I keep saying, we, sh we should spend more time on. <laughs> I'm going to skip ahead to the final uh, challenge now, and that is kind of um, embracing the unknown. And Derek, I know you brought this up uh, when we were coming up with this set of five challenges. Why did it speak to you as a really big challenge uh, for contact centers right now? Well, I, I think... You know, th th <laughs> Um, as we head into this unknown, which is the, the kind of the new world of, of AI, um, there has been a lot of kind of fear around and, and hesitation around some of the, the potential challenges around that we just talked about in terms of security and hallucinations. Um, 
but there are just clearly so many opportunities and benefits that that haven't been achieved just yet. And it is identifying those use cases. It is identifying the applications that your organization could use, um, and really em embracing what 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 you don't know yet. There's you know there's also FOMO, like fear of missing out too, right? And and, and there's a lot of customers, uh, end user companies that are applying that are using this, these technologies that, that fear their competitors are using this technology. So so that's the unknown, right? And so. With within um, what what's next for AI for contact centers, you need to look beyond your your the contact center. I think that's something we're seeing a lot too is um, sharing insights across your organization. The, the, well, there's always been a, a use. There's always been a use for conversational data that comes into you, to contact centers that's usually only applied for operational improvements or very you know um, you know important yet pretty simple applications. As AI and all of the the opportunities around AI can be shared across your your organization across you know marketing HR. Um, executive team, wh whatever it may be, I think there's going to be more opportunities there, um, and and that's that's what I think is is the 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 unknown that that should be focused on. We're, we we at Opus have an optimistic view. I mean, we we really do think that this there, there's a potential for 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 um, these technologies, and they have been around for a while. Let's be honest. I mean, like 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 yeah, certainly the the, the kind of commercialized Chat GPT, but but these the, the technologies have been put put um, put together for some 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 years now. Um, identifying those appropriate. Uh, you know, beneficial use case of your organization is is truly the, the the next step, and 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 yeah, like like I said, kind of sharing insights across your organization is going to be an, an exciting part of of what's what's next. Yeah, and you know, I, I will agree with you know. I think it's a it's a really important point to before you could share insights across the organization, you got to generate the insights, right? And one of the interesting yeah. things, you know, nice allows you. And the way that we've solved this for lots of our customers and organizations around the world is, you know, we allow as a, you know, as Elevate AI and others, we allow you to very easily generate these types of generative AI insights and other models, right? It's when we talk about AI, in today's world, it's always generative AI, generative AI, generative AI, yeah. right? Yeah. That's not where AI ends, right? It's just a part of the toolkit of AI. And NICE uses different things, right? We use neural nets for certain aspects to measure agent performance as an example. We use mm -hmm. um, transformers to deliver the amazing transcription capabilities that Elevate AI offers. And we use generative AI to do things like auto summarization, question and answering, right? So those are all things that are packaged. But, uh, you know, I always encourage organizations that look, you know, AI data isn't just about isolated into agent, agent desktops or supervisors desktops. It's something just like you've mentioned, it's something that has to go throughout your organizations, but you got to get started with actually using things like Elevate AI to generate the data first. Hmm. Yeah, and I think maybe a really great use case of how uh, brands can start to embrace the unknown uh, with contact center AI is the kind of 1K a day uh, initiative that you have um, at NICE. Before we kind of close, I don't know, Niraj, if you could quickly outline uh, outline that initiative. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, It's a really important initiative and we kind of kicked it off uh, late last year, and it's been it's been a wild success. So Elevate AI is the platform for Nice's um, enterprise APIs, right? So think about rather than you buying CX One or some other big platform, right now you can just go into Elevate AI and actually use the underlying Nice technologies, right? So when we talk about generating AI assets, you don't have to wait. You can go to ElevateAI.com and start mm -hmm. generating transcriptions using auto summarization. Uh, getting all these amazing neural nets to help your agents go forward. And the 1K a day is a what we consider to be an amazing platform. It's a thousand free interactions a day processing, right? You can get transcriptions, generative AI. It's it's free. It's unheard of in this market. And we're doing this because we know that there's a significant amount of value in this data. And we want organizations to start to stop really talking about jumping on the AI bandwagon and actually getting there. Right? Right. That's the big thing that we're trying to do here. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And what I'll do uh, for anybody who wants to learn more about that is I'll put a link in the description uh, description box and back to the NICE website for anybody who wants to learn more about NICE AI. And also, I will quickly uh, give a uh, direct opportunity. Obviously, Opus uh, is perhaps the leading CX AI analyst, definitely that I see in my day-to-day -day work. Is there anything maybe that you have going on? I know you have conversational AI awards that you want to give a quick uh, shout out to. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thanks for the, the props. Um, yeah, we do. We have some conversational AI awards that are that are actually um, a week away from from uh, being, uh, there's a deadline on that. But but yeah, we, we want to showcase actually real world examples of AI in, in the wild and, and really showcasing those those benefits. So, so showcasing what it means and, and really kind of pushing the, the, the ball forward in terms of what, what is next um, in, in addition to, to kind of the reports and the, and the 
uh, the white papers we put together. Mm -hmm. we, we, we definitely want to we want to um, encourage people to, to tell us what you're doing because we want to help, help amplify those messages. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. Really great to have you both uh, join me today, actually, to um, there's such great uh, minds on this topic. So it's also great for my learning as well as hopefully everybody for watching. Um, so, yeah, thanks both uh, for joining me today. A really great discussion. Um, and also thanks to everybody for watching. Bye for now.